When you turn on the news, the fear factory is still hard at work, creatively inventing new ways to twist the data, not just beyond what the numbers actually say, but beyond what you can see for yourself if you just work up enough courage to step outside your door. It's a nice, bright, sunny day, and there's no coronavirus that's going to jump out and drag you away to the slaughter. Any honest news reporting would say, hey, look, cases and deaths are at their lowest levels since March of 2020, the very beginning. And that's with testing capacity that's massively larger now than it was back then. So you can be confident that viral spread is approaching statistical non-existence, or at least a level that's low enough that it shouldn't change your way of life. You likely engage in all sorts of behaviors on a daily basis that statistically are much more dangerous than the risk that these numbers present. But they're not telling you that. Instead, they distort numbers and scrape the absolute bottom of the data barrel for any last scoops of fear they can still shovel at you. For example, you'll notice they almost always report in terms of percentages now, never raw numbers. Why? Because when raw numbers are small, Percent changes can look large. Tonight, the Delta variant is COVID's most serious threat. It's starting to accelerate really quickly in the U.S. So last week, about 10% of the virus isolates were the Delta variant. Now it's up to 19%. So it seems to have pretty regular, regular doubling. Okay, but 10% of what? 20%. Of what? He's telling you that a larger chunk of the cases are this particular Delta variant without telling you that cases overall are dropping. That's a totally manipulative omission. It gives you the impression that cases are increasing, but they're not. They fell off a cliff months ago. A large and even increasing percentage of an all-time low is still an all-time low. And since they can't claim that overall case increase, another strategy they'll use is to find isolated pockets of it. Find one statistical anomaly state and use that to hype the fear. Missouri is seeing an alarming rise in new cases, up 59% over the last two weeks, the highest in the country. Again, up 59% from what to what? Take a look at the data, and Missouri cases are up slightly. That is true. About 650 cases daily average at the time of this reporting from 400 or so two weeks prior. But those are numbers that are still well below last summer's and well, well below late fall, early winter highs, nearly 90% down since November, in fact. And here's another key omission. Hardly anybody is dying in Missouri. The state is averaging just one or two deaths a day. That's down from a high of about 85 a day in December. In other words, coronavirus deaths in Missouri are down almost 99%. And nationally, they're down over 90% in that same time frame. But they'll still say that the Delta variant is the most dangerous we've ever seen. The deadly and dangerous Delta variant. The highly contagious Delta variant. The Delta variant is currently the greatest threat in the U.S. No, the greatest threat to your well-being is allowing these people any sort of control over your life. They'll put you in a prison cell and tell you it's for your own good and insist you should be grateful for it. And granted, maybe you like that prison cell if there's a rabid tiger on the loose outside, but there isn't. And even if you think there was a rabid tiger out there before, he's dead now. He has been for weeks and months. It's time for an autopsy, not a resurrection. And that's where our journalistic and scientific resources need to be directed. We need to know how and why this happened, not invent new strategies and messaging to keep it happening in people's minds. But at least a few are serious about finding that information and keeping a mind open to where the evidence leads rather than just accepting WHO propaganda as scientific substitute. One such person is Dr. Jesse Bloom, a virologist at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle. He's curious about virus origins, so he just published a paper describing how he went searching for gene sequences of some of the earliest known cases of the virus that data formerly available in an NIH database, which is the first place he searched. Unable to find what he was looking for in that NIH database, Dr. Bloom eventually found it elsewhere in a previously published journal paper. And there are two important pieces to what Dr. Bloom learned. First, what he was able to discover through that data about the virus origins, but arguably more importantly, why he wasn't able to find the NIH data in the first place. Let's consider what Dr. Bloom learned about virus origins first. He was able to analyze 13 partial genetic sequences from some of the earliest known cases of coronavirus in Wuhan. 
Dr. Bloom is careful in his paper not to make conclusive statements about the origin of the virus based on his analysis, but he does identify some key facts that point in certain directions, even if they don't lead us to a definitive conclusion. Remember early in the virus spread, and according to WHO and Chinese claims, the virus had originated at a Wuhan seafood market in late December 2019. Dr. Bloom's research puts that theory into serious doubt. Dr. Bloom was able to compare gene sequences from the seafood market cases to gene sequences in other early cases with no connection to the market. And what he found is those sequences with no connection to the market are missing three mutations relative to the cases that were at the seafood market. The absence of those three mutations makes them more similar to a bat coronavirus than the seafood market samples. So what can we infer from that? Well, if the cases that showed up at the market had mutations that other early cases away from the market did not have, and the other early cases are closer to a theoretical bat origin, it would imply the virus existed away from the market first. It would suggest that coronavirus was circulating in Wuhan before the seafood market outbreak. So it's highly unlikely that the market is in fact the origin, which isn't totally new information. We knew that based on US intel of sick lab workers earlier in the fall, as well as Chinese news articles as Bloom cites. And Dr. Bloom is very careful not to say that his findings support a lab origin theory, and it's true. It's not affirmative evidence in favor of the lab, it's just evidence against the seafood market as the origin. But this is a situation with limited origin possibilities, so evidence against one is at least weak evidence in favor of the other, if only through the process of elimination. This isn't a groundbreaking new discovery, but it is another solid piece of evidence in tracing the virus origins. And Dr. Bloom's findings are significant in tracing that viral source, so this is not to diminish them. But the bigger story about his paper is the difficulty he had in writing it, and it's not because of the complexity of the subject matter, though it is complex. It's because the information for analysis wasn't as readily accessible as it should have been. It was just missing from the place it was formerly stored. In conducting his work, Dr. Bloom read a paper by other researchers that referenced 241 early coronavirus cases, genetic sequencing records of which were apparently stored on a database managed by our own National Institute of Health, the NIH. This database is called the Sequence Read Archive. Dr. Bloom thought, hey, great place to start. I'll go track down that data. But when he went to the source, that NIH database, it returned no items found. A search for individual records gave a different message. The genetic sequences had been removed, deleted from the database. So Dr. Bloom went searching for the data elsewhere, recovering some of it from another paper written on the topic. But that of course means that the cases available for Dr. Bloom's analysis were greatly limited. The original paper that had grabbed Dr. Bloom's attention analyzed 241 coronavirus cases. Because of this mysterious data disappearance, Dr. Bloom could only analyze 13. And Dr. Bloom wasn't sure who deleted these files or why they were deleted, though he does note that while external users can post data to the NIH database, only NIH staff can edit or delete the data that it holds. So Dr. Bloom contacted the NIH to ask about this deletion, and they did get back to him with what happened, though he deferred to them to share that information publicly. And on Wednesday, the NIH did that, releasing a statement that says, submitting investigators hold the rights to their data and can request withdrawal of the data. In other words, the NIH says, we're just hosting data for people who post it and still own it. If they want to take it down, we'll take it down. Sort of like if I decided I wanted to delete this YouTube video, YouTube gives me the tools to do that. Okay, so who owns the data then, and who requested the data deletion? Well, according to the NIH, it was a Chinese scientist who submitted those sequences. And it was that same Chinese scientist who requested in June of 2020 that the data be deleted because he says the data had been updated and were posted to another unspecified database. This Chinese researcher wanted to avoid confusion, according to the NIH. But as Dr. Bloom notes in his paper, there is no plausible scientific reason for that deletion. 
The sequencing data is still referenced in that paper that originally grabbed his interest, and that paper is still published with no edit or correction added on it. And there's no evidence that the information is wrong or otherwise contaminated. And even if it was, you'd still think the proper protocol would be to annotate the data with a correction, maybe a link to updated, better information, just like a newspaper article or any other source of reputable information. Deletion implies an effort to conceal, and if this Chinese researcher was trying to avoid confusion, it's pretty bizarre that he didn't make any effort to direct anybody to this new, unspecified data source. Nobody even knows where this information exists now, if it's even publicly available at all. If his aims were clearer, more accurate data, his results were missing data. And if you find any of that suspicious, just remember some of Dr. Fauci's unquestionable advice. Trust the Chinese. They're very competent, trustworthy scientists. I'm not talking about anything else in China. I'm talking about the scientists. So you don't think the Chinese would lie to you? I know the scientists that we've dealt with have been trustworthy. Certainly not the most confidence inspiring, but if there's one thing I trust even less than Chinese scientific data transparency, it's our own media's curiosity about it. And that's the other key thing not to forget in this story. Data of the earliest coronavirus cases that we have went mysteriously missing more than a year ago. And apparently nobody was an investigator serious enough to try to find out why or to even learn that it ever happened at all. They've all been too busy thinking up creative ways to keep you housebound and to kill your business and to close your church and your kid's school. Instead of scratching just a little bit to figure out why any of that devastation was ever necessary in the first place. Trust the science, they said. While the science was deleted on their watch, and they never even noticed at all. Thanks as always for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Minds that is at ML Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chat in my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Luke King, forward to it, goodbye.